Well, one of the things that we, uh, I think, have noticed over the last week and a half, for you that were here last week, for you that, that joined us this week as you picked up with us on our journey with Moses and the people of God, is that God put an incredible call on Moses' life. Right? If you remember back for you that were here and for you that were not here, you know, Moses' call in his life was something that I think he thought he was going to get to do when he was a young man. Right? That, that there was something within Moses that thought, God is going to use me, or I want to be used of God and by God in order to deliver my people who are enslaved by Pharaoh and mistreated. But then you remember Moses messed up. Right? He, he killed a man, out, not out of out of wanting to, to protect his, his fellow countrymen and his, a way to incur their favor, but it backfired. He spent 40 years in the wilderness taking care of sheep, but God showed up and he called him, and yet Moses was reluctant. He had excuses, he had insecurities, he had anxieties about, about serving God. And he also found out that even when he said yes to God, finally, that it was not always easy. Right? If we would look at Moses' journey, we'd say, Moses' journey was definitely not always easy, was it? Right? Th there were highs and lows. There were moments where it seemed like, yes, I'm doing the right thing, and God's blessing, and then the people would grumble and complain. Then Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. Moses had thoughts about quitting and going back. But God was gracious to him, and Moses' faith has grown. And we have seen that. We've seen the Israelite people on their own journey, which is a struggle. And I think from all of that, we can realize that following God's call on your life, and I believe God has a call on your life, right? That He has called you to know Him, right? That's the message of the gospel, right? That God so loved the world that He gave His Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life and an everlasting relationship with Him where you might know God personally for all of eternity. He's given you a call to worship Him, and to glorify Him, to serve Him, to be His ambassadors, to represent His kingdom, the kingdom of God here on earth. And there are specific ways that God is going to use you in that call. And it's my prayer that you would hear and know and discover and live for God's call in your life. But I also know that doing that is not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy to follow God. It's not easy to live for Him because there's challenges and there's obstacles. There's difficulties. There's doubts like we talked about yesterday. And so today as we, we continue the journey with Moses, we're going to come to a scene where, where, where the Hebrew people face a battle, a real battle. They're going to be attacked by a group of people called the Amicalites. Right? And these, these people were evil and they decided to attack them and they did so in a very, very low-handed way. They attacked them from their rear. So they attacked them where the weakest people were, the stragglers, the youngest, the sick. And so the Hebrew people are going to have to fight to defend themselves. And we're going to see that there's a crucial element to this battle. And it's the same element that's crucial to our journeys in following God, and that's prayer. So we're going to talk about prayer today and how important prayer is on our journey of following God. So Exodus chapter 17, because you're going to face battles. You're going to face opposition. You're going to face things that are overwhelming. And God has given you something for those moments. And that's prayer. So let's look at Exodus chapter 17 and begin in verse 8. Exodus 17, beginning in verse 8. The Amicalites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidium. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amicalites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. And so Moses commissions Joshua, who's become his understudy, the one that he is mentoring and who ultimately will become the leader when Moses dies. And he tells Joshua that you're to go out in a battle, but I'm going up on top of the hill with the staff of God. Right, that, that physical, tangible thing that represented God's presence with Moses. And he says, I'm going to go up on top of the hill. And there Moses is going to pray. So notice verse 10. Joshua fought the Amicalites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. 
And as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amicalites were winning. Now, raising his hands was a, a typical posture of prayer for his time. So this, this is definitely signifying that when Moses was praying with his hands out, God was giving victory to them. But when Moses' hands were down, they started losing. Now, I want you for a moment to put yourselves in the position of one of the, the Hebrews that's fighting the battle. Right? Are you with me? Are you there? Are you awake enough to be there? All right. You're fighting the battle. And as long as Moses has his hands up, you're doing great. But when Moses gets tired and he drops his hands, you start getting beat. All right? How many of you would be looking up on the hill kind of like, come on, right? Anybody? Are you with me? All right. Get your hands up, Moses. Right? As long as he held up his hands, as long as he was praying and seeking God, they were winning. Why? Well, I, I think it's because God is always wanting to show us himself. He's always also wanting to show us that, that without him, we can't have any ultimate victory. Right? That, that I, can't, I can't fulfill the call of God on my life. I can't live for his purposes. I can't, I can't fulfill the purpose for which I was created without God's empowerment. I can't stand up here and share God's word with you without the Holy Spirit helping me, right? I, I can't get up here without just praying, God, you've got to help me, right? You, I want you to put your words in my mouth. I want you to lead me. I want your spirit to enable me because I'm not able. And so Moses is praying, and as long as this Moses is praying, they were winning. You know, prayer is so powerful, right? And prayer is an amazing privilege, that God has given us, to commune with Him, right? To share the deepest places of our heart, to pour out our heart before Him because He's a refuge for us. It's a place where we can confess our sin. It's a place where we can seek His grace to help in our time of need. But it's also an incredible mystery because God uses prayer to accomplish His purposes on earth. Now, He doesn't have to do that. God could do it any way He wanted. God could snap His fingers or not snap His fingers and accomplish His purposes. But He has chosen to work through the prayers of His people. He has chosen to involve us in what He is doing on this earth. And so prayer is an incredible privilege. Sometimes it's easy to pray. But a lot of times, it's difficult to pray. How many of you ever get distracted when you're praying? All right. Man, it's so easy. You start praying, and maybe you're praying for someone, and then you think about that person, and you think about a situation, and whatever it might be, and all of a sudden you're a thousand miles away from praying. Or have you ever fallen asleep while you're praying? Right? It's so easy to get distracted, or it's so easy sometimes to say, I just don't know what to pray. And listen, prayer's a battle. Right? When you are praying, you're entering a spiritual battle. Right? And there are real forces that push back against that. Satan is real. Demons are real. Right? There are dark forces. And so when we pray, there is a battle taking place. Paul, uh, in Colossians chapter 4, describes the ministry of a man named Epaphras. Right? And he says that he always labors fervently for you in prayer. Right? That, that, that he doesn't just say prayers for you, but he labors in it. He works in prayer. That there's effort and energy expended in prayer. And then he prays fervently with passion and energy. And so Paul says that we have to be earnest in prayer, to be vigilant in prayer. And so as, as, they, uh, as they're praying, God is giving victory. But notice verse 12. It says, when Moses' hands grew tired. Right? They took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. So Moses is up there, and he's doing his best, but he's, you know, his shoulders are burning, right? His lower back is aching. Are you with me? And so they get him a stone, and they put it under him. They're like, sit on this, and you can keep your hands up. And then it says, Aaron and her come on either side of him and hold his hands up steady until sunset. They're like, you can't hold them up all day, but we'll hold them up with you. And there's an amazing picture, right? Not only are we to pray, and we can pray individually, but sometimes we pray together, corporately, right? And we encourage one another in prayer, and we pray together. And so they support him. And so though this was Moses' work to do, it was more than he could do by himself, right? He could not win this battle in prayer even by himself. He needed the support of others. And so 
I, I think we get to see in this, in this amazing picture, right? If, if you can picture this battle taking place and Moses up on the hillside sitting on this stone with Aaron and her on either side holding his arms up. And so long as that was happening, God was giving them victory. Why? He wanted them not to have confidence in themselves. Wow, we really whipped the Amalekites, right? We're pretty good. Who's next, right? Are you with me? Right? They, might have, they might have been tempted to have that mentality, but instead they knew that only as God empowered them, only as God enabled them, were they able to have real victory. But praying did not eliminate their need to fight. So it's important for us to remember that, that prayer is essential in our call on our lives. Right? That we're never going to accomplish the call of God on our life the purpose that he has for us, without depending on God in prayer, without seeking him, right? Without seeking his wisdom. God, I I need to know what to do. I need you to direct my steps. I don't know what to do. God, I need your power. I'm weak. God, would you strengthen me for this task? God, I'm overwhelmed, right? I, I need your peace that passes all understanding to guard my heart and my mind. God, I need you. You're never going to accomplish the call of God on your life without an absolute dependence on God. And prayer is essential in that. But it also requires us to then take steps of faith, right? That that we don't just pray about it, but God's going to take to lead us to do what we're praying about. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, prayer is a downright mockery if it does not lead us into the practical use of the means likely to promote the ends for which we pray. So let's just give an example. You're saying, God... I need your help with my music this week, right? I'm never going to be ready for the concert unless you help me. And here's what God will do. I will help you. But you're going to practice two hours. Amen? Right? Right. See, see God will help you. Right? He's going to hear your prayer. He's with you. But He's not just going to zap you with that ability. He's going to lead you to the ordinary means by which He will work through. Right? Practicing, rehearsing, working. Verse 13, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. And then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. So Moses, he takes this occasion to build an altar of stone, a place of remembrance, A place of acknowledging that God did something here that only He could have done and that He has gotten the glory. And He says, it's the Lord who's my banner. He's the one who who covers us. The the word for banner can also be used for flag. And, and, you know, know, it's not that they were raising their victory flag after this battle, saying, look what we have done. But He says, no, it's the Lord who's our banner. It's the Lord who's our victory. Right? He's the one who does it. And listen, God's call in your life is going to be overwhelming at times. I've experienced that. I can't do this. I don't want to do this. Right? That's why one of the reasons I wrestled with the call that God put on my life when I was sitting right where you're sitting, I wrestled with that for three years before I really fully said yes. And one of the reasons is because all those things, I don't want to do this. I can't do this. I'm not good enough to do this. I'm not, I'm not able to do this. Right? The Lord is your banner. Right? He's the one who'll do it. Faithful is he who called you, who will what? Also, all right, all together, two words. Do it. All right, four letters. Right, you can remember that. Faithful is he who called you, who will also do it. Thank you. Verse 16. He said, because, Moses said, the the reason we're calling it the Lord is my banner is because hands were lifted against the throne of the Lord. And the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. And so he built that altar there. I just want to challenge you today to realize, yes, God's call is overwhelming. And it's not easy. And even after you start out, it's, it's, it's a lot, I think, like Moses' journey. There's moments of success and moments of like, okay, I think I can do this. Or, God, with your help, I can do this. And then there's times where I don't want to do this anymore. Right? Moses had those moments where I want to go back. Right? This is too much. And even, even yesterday, you know, he was overwhelmed when, when they were asking for water. Once again, you know, there, there they are. They're out in the desert complaining that there's no water. Right? I mean... They knew there was no water. They, they also knew that God was with them. But they complained and they grumbled. And Moses said, 
I, I can't even anymore. God, I know you can do this, but man, I, I, I'm, I'm at a breaking point. And you'll get to those moments in life. But that's why we have prayer. Because we can go to the Lord with our burdens when we're overwhelmed, when we can't. And not only can we go to Him to get strength and help and grace in our time of need, but then we also can come boldly before Him asking for His purposes to take place on earth. Right? When, G- when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, and He gave them a model prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Right? And in that prayer, He told them that they were pray for God's will to be done on earth, even as it's done in heaven. Right? In heaven, God's will is always done perfectly and completely. And He says, you can pray for God's will to be done on earth, even as, as it's done in heaven. Because on earth, there's sometimes many things that don't go according to God's good and perfect will. People do evil. Right? People sin. They commit wickedness. But he says, we get the privilege of praying for God's purposes to take place on earth. God works through prayer. And anyone can pray. If you know Jesus is your Savior, you have direct access to the throne room of heaven. The same access I have. The same access any other believer has. And prayer is so powerful. And you can pray. And you can see God use you in incredible ways. Incredible ways. The Apostle Paul, as he wrote to the church, he says, pray without ceasing. Pray all of the time. Pray about everything. Pray everywhere. Because this is your direct connection with heaven. The direct connection that you have with the God of the universe. Three three things, and then I want to share something that I've been praying for you. But, number one, prayer is hard. It's hard. It's a battle. I mean, I even think about the disciples. Right, The night before Jesus goes to the cross and he goes to the garden to pray and to seek his Father for the strength and the grace that he's going to need to accomplish what is before him. And he's so overwhelmingly burdened. And he asks his disciples, what? Would you not watch and what? Pray with me. And of course, every time they do what? They pray for a couple of minutes and they fall asleep. He wakes them up, says, hey guys, can we pray? Yeah, 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 we can pray, right? And then they fall asleep. Prayer's hard. Prayer is hard. It takes effort. It takes work. It's a battle. It's a struggle. There'll be days where you say, man, I, I didn't do so well today. There'll be weeks. You say, I haven't prayed so well this week. There might be a month, right? You say, I haven't prayed so well. It's a battle. That's okay. Keep pursuing. Number two, prayer is powerful, right? Prayer can do anything that God can do. And so we have the opportunity to see God's power at work through prayer. Number three, prayer is a privilege. It's an amazing privilege. Right? Not only is it a blessing that we can access God at any time, but it's an amazing privilege. Right? There are a lot of places on earth that you just can't go anytime you want. Right? You have to get permission. Right? If we were to just show up at the White House today, we couldn't just knock on the door and walk in, could we? Well, you could try. Well, not, probably would never get to the door, would you? Right. Or you just can't do that. And there's a lot of other situations. But you have access to go to the throne room of heaven and to come before the God of the universe and know that if you're in Christ, He will accept you because you come with Jesus, your Savior. You come covered and redeemed by His blood. And He has promised to accept you. right? He's never going to say, no, 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 not right now. Or, I'm busy. Or, what are you doing here? He's going to accept you. right? He's going to listen to you. He's going to hear you. Prayer is an incredible privilege. Sometimes we need support. We need encouragement. We need people to pray with us or for us. right? There's been times of struggle in my own life where I, I didn't even know how to pray for myself. And God just put other people in my life that prayed for me. And I, I see that, that picture of Aaron and her holding up Moses' hands. Right? Sometimes you need that encouragement. And obviously prayer is a mystery. Right? It, it's a mystery. There, there's, some, there's some supernatural mystery there that says, I don't understand how it all works or why God chooses to work this way or how He works through my prayers, but He has chosen to do that. And so I want to challenge you. I want to call you. I want to encourage you to a life of prayer, to make prayer a priority because you need God to fulfill the call He's put on your life. And it's not going to be easy. But He has given you Himself. And then I just want to share for a couple of minutes before we close what I've been praying for you. And God put on my heart 
several weeks ago a passage of scripture to pray over you. And so many of you I, I've known before, and many of you I don't know, but I know that God knew you, and he knew you would be sitting here. He knew you'd be sitting at the table you're sitting at today. And so I've been praying this from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 19, over you. And Paul there, as he's writing the letter to a church that he dearly loves, had spent three years with, he's in prison now, and he's writing to them. He says, this is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. Right? Paul says, I, I am praying for you. And how encouraging that must have been for the believers in Ephesus, right? To, to get this letter from Paul and to know he says, here I am far away in Rome, but I am praying for you. And he says, here's what I'm praying. I'm praying, verse 17, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious, the glorious Father, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Right? I've been praying that God would do that for you. That while you're here, at Chehi, that God would give you a revelation of who He is, that you would grow in your knowledge of Him. And not just your knowledge about Him. Right? When we come to knowledge of God, there, I think there's two key areas. We need to know about Him, the truth of who He is, His character, His nature, as He's revealed in the Bible. But we also have to have an experiential knowledge of God where we know Him relationally, personally, intimately. And I've been praying that for you. Then He said that I pray, verse 18, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the glorious riches of his inheritance among the saints? I've been praying that, that you would have a confident hope in the calling of God on your life. Right? That you would come to a place of deeper confidence in Christ. To say, I really can know him. And I really can trust him. I really can depend on him. And I can really give my life to him because he is worthy. He says, I was praying that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, right? That they would be, there would be light that would pour in so that you could see and know the hope of your calling. You've been called to know him. You've been called to serve him, but you've been called to be with him for all of eternity. And that's where all of this ends, right? All of this ends. I love the last verse, right, of the hymn that we sang this morning. In mansions of glory and endless delight, right? We're going to be with him for all of eternity, we're going to be with Him. And that gives us a confident hope to say, yes, now, there may be days of difficulty. There may be days of struggle. There may be days of darkness. There's going to be moments of doubt. But I have a confident hope that because Jesus died for me, because He rose for me, because He prays for me at the right hand of the Father, and because He's coming again one day, I can have confidence in Him. And then verse 19, He prayed that they would understand what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of his vast strength. And so I've been praying that you would know and experience God's power in your life, that you would experience and see his very real hand in your life. And so I've been praying these things over you, that you would grow in your knowledge of God. Again, not just intellectually, not just information, but that you would grow in your knowledge of him, that you would really know God. And realize that He's invited you to know Him. I've been praying that you would have a more confident hope in Christ. That wherever you're at in your walk with Christ, that you would leave here more confident in who He is. right? More confident in His call on your life. And more confident of the hope that you have in Him. To say, I have a living hope. right? Peter, when he wrote to the church, right, he says, We have been born again to a living hope. The resurrection from the dead. And then I've been praying that you would know and experience God's power. Right? That you would experience His incredible power on your life and in your life. So that you would realize that yes, I am weak and yes, I'm not always able and I don't always feel competent and I don't always feel like I can, but there's a God who has unlimited power and He's with me and He is faithful and He's promised to meet my needs. And so I know that following God's call in your life will not be easy. It may not be safe. It may not be comfortable, it may be overwhelming, but it's absolutely worth it. And you have prayer. So when we're tempted to grumble or to complain, when we're tempted to say, God, this is not fair, this isn't what I signed up for, may we remember instead to turn and look to Him and say, God, I'm struggling, but I need you. 
Help me. Help me to know you. Help me to, to have a confident hope in you despite the struggle that I'm going through. And help me to experience your power because I desperately need you. Would we, could we pray together this morning? Father, I, I thank you for your overwhelming faithfulness. I thank you that you are faithful even when we are unfaithful. Father, I thank you that you are patient and you never give up on us. And Father, I thank you that you're faithful to pursue us even when we try to run and hide. And Father, maybe there's someone today that is really sensing your call on their life. Maybe you're calling them to salvation and you're calling them to repent of their sin and to put their faith and trust in you, but they're resisting. And God, I pray that you would today reveal yourself to them, that you are the God who loves them and gave yourself for them. And that they would know you as Savior. Father, there might be someone today that is, that is running from your call on their life. They're, they're hiding from that call. They're, they're pulling away from that call because of maybe many reasons. Inadequacy, feeling overwhelmed, insecure, doubts. Father, I pray that you'd give them the faith and the confidence to say yes to you today. And Father, I pray that we would realize the incredible privilege of prayer, that, that it's not our strength, our intellect, our abilities that, that will ultimately give us victory in life to pursue your call, but it's your power and your grace, and that prayer is an avenue that you have given us to, to experience you, to know you, to experience your power in our lives, to pour out our hearts before you, but also to pray for your purposes to be done. And to pray boldly and confidently for your kingdom purposes to come to pass on earth, even as they are done in heaven. So, Father, I ask that today, that today, that your kingdom purposes would come to pass for us. That in all of our, our rehearsals and practice and work today, that your kingdom purposes would come to pass. And, Father, I pray for each student, counselor, faculty member, and myself, that we would grow in our knowledge of you, that we would have a more confident hope in you, and that we would experience your power. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dan. So get ready for the day. We've got two days.